Amber Alyssa Tukaro was a fiercely courageous, confident, and compassionate young woman. Beloved by her friends and family, her deep-rooted connection with cultivating relationships, as well as her passion to nurture those in need and make a positive impact on the world around her, was cut short by an unexplainable, unsolved death in the dog days of summer 2010. She left all who knew her in the Mikishu Cree First Nation in Alberta, Canada, and the entire country at large, devastated, bewildered, and horrified in the wake of her tragic murder. In the hope of providing a more substantial reasoning based upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the death of Amber Tukaro and the suspicious audio recording from Amber's final phone call that may provide a clue to identify her unknown killer. This is Cold Case Detective. Amber Alyssa Tukaro was born on January 3rd, 1990, as a part of the Minishu First Nation Crew, an indigenous First Nations government of woodland Cree people in northeastern Alberta, Canada. Three days after her birth, she was adopted by the Tukaro family, led by her soon-to-be mother, Vivian Tutsi Tukaro. She joined a family of all male children. Tootsie and her husband at the time had always wanted a baby girl of their own and looked into adoptions as a solution. Thus, when they received a call about an opportunity to adopt, Amber was happily introduced to the Tukaro clan and was instantly loved by each member of the family. Growing up, Amber wasted no time forging a close relationship with her parents and brothers, Paul, Billy Joe, Conrad, and Justin. Together, the Tukuro siblings grew up in Fort Chippewyan as a part of the Minishu First Nation Crew Reserve, which was signed to the indigenous tribe in a treaty with Canada in 1986. Paul Tukuro and his brothers took special care in looking after Amber, later saying that she was coddled, but she also picked up on vital parts of living quite early, learning how to walk at the surprising age of only eight months. This solidified a resounding resilience in Amber, who hardened into a fiercely independent and resourceful young woman. Paul later said at the MMIW National Inquiry, revolving around Amber's death, that she was the family's pride and joy, and had a special place in Tootsie's heart as the daughter she never thought she'd have. A few years later into Amber's life, Tootsie and her then-husband filed for divorce. While it was originally planned to split up the family, with the siblings breaking up into two residencies with each parent, it ultimately left Tootsie with all of her children. However, like many broken marriages, the divorce left Paul and his brothers to take leadership roles within the family, continuing to look after Amber and their mother. The brothers shared cooking and cleaning duties, whilst all the siblings attended Athabasca Delta Community Schools. As a teenager, Amber struggled with staying motivated to continue school in the reservation education system, but kept at it after the prodding of her older brothers, who constantly preached how important education was for a family who lacked it in generations prior. Once the brothers grew older and started miniature families themselves, Amber played a vital role in fostering relationships with her sisters-in-law, nieces, and nephews. One of the many interests she developed over the years was a fascination with music, and would introduce an eclectic variation of songs to her younger family members she looked after, much like her brothers did for her. She grew incredibly proud of her nieces and nephews, and infected them with her happy-go-lucky spirits whenever she visited. In June of 2009, Amber had a child of her own, giving birth to a son named Jacob. Jacob became Amber's everything, and she cared for him deeply. 
The two went everywhere together, even on trips outside Fort McMurray where she last lived. Tutsi Tukuro often warned Amber of the dangers of such adventures, but Amber's forwardness and hard-headed spirit persisted. She was never afraid to get her hands dirty and always stuck up for herself and her loved ones. Sadly, however, the last trip the mother and son duo ever ventured on would prove to be fatal. When on the night of August 18th, 2010, Amber last made contact with her Tukuro family and then disappeared into the calm countryside of Edmonton. The site where her homicide investigation would break out two years later, when it was discovered that it was here that she drew her last breaths in Leduc County. Let's turn now to a timeline of the events leading up to Amber's death. For 20 years, between the 1990s and the end of the noughties, Tutsi Tukuro looks out for her daughter, Amber Tukuro, like a hawk, always preaching common sense, safety, and daily precaution, as any mother will. These tips included warnings of staying away from strangers and getting into cars with unknown men. It fastens an important bond between her and her only female child. Fast forward to 2010, and Amber blossoms into an independent and lively soul, starting a family with her own newborn son, Jacob, and surrounding herself with devoted friends. She develops an explorative soul and a curiosity that inspires her to take trips around Canada and check out the various cities and cultures outside of her hometown lands. Later that same summer, in August of 2010, Amber decides to plan a trip to Edmonton to visit a friend. She invites another one of her unidentified friends to join her and her 14-month-old son, aiming to leave in the middle of the month for a two-day excursion. Soon after, the plans are forged. Amber informs her mother of the short Edmonton vacation. Tutsi immediately feels uneasy about the idea and tells her daughter she shouldn't go, hearkening back to her safety standards of adolescence. Amber's independent and forward spirit holds true, however, and she keeps the plans intact. On Tuesday, August 17th, Amber packs up a few essentials and heads to the airport with Jacob and her friend and flies from Fort McMurray to Edmonton International Airport. Later on the 17th, the young trio arrives just outside of the city near the airport and checks into the Nisku Place Motel for lodging. During their stay at the motel, Amber stays in constant communication with her mother, sending along texts and updates throughout the afternoon. On day two of the trip, Wednesday, August 18th, Amber agrees with her friend that they will travel into the city the following day. Their funds are not large and they plot ways to save money during the trip. As the evening draws near on the 18th, Amber decides she wants to head into Edmonton earlier than they planned. Being low on cash, she makes unknown arrangements for a ride into the city and leaves Jacob with her friend at the Nisku Motel. Without divulging any specifics of the ride or details about who is picking her up, Amber leaves for a hitchhike in the stranger's vehicle. This will be the last confirmed time anyone sees Amber Tukuro. During Amber's ride with her mysterious driver, she receives a phone call from her brother in the Edmonton Remand Center, a local prison system. The entire conversation lasts 17 minutes and includes multiple instances of Amber questioning her driver of their intended destination, to which he replies with suspicious and strange answers. The call ends without notice and would be the last confirmed time anyone talked to or heard from Amber Tukaro. As we fall deeper into the night of August 18th, both Amber's friend and Tutsi Tukuro lose all contact with Amber, who no longer responds to texts or phone calls. Tutsi immediately feels intense worry, remembering her daughter's hard-headedness to all of her warnings about the mischievous characters of the world. Knowing her daughter's silence is too abnormal for comfort, Tutsi calls the authorities and reports Amber missing. After the Royal Canadian Mounted Police receives the missing person's reports, they tell Tutsi the case is not of any serious importance. Their excuse is that Amber is probably out partying and snuck away for recreation, and will call later that night or the next day. 24 hours go by, and Amber remains silent. Tutsi pushes the missing person's reports, and the RCMP finally takes initiative to investigate. 
Over the next 14 months, the RCMP interviews people both familiar with Amber and folks around Edmonton's outskirts. They develop few leads and find little to no evidence around Nisku. In October of 2011, the RCMP officially asks for investigative assistance from Project CARE, a special task force that focuses on missing and murdered women's cases. Yet, it wouldn't be for another 10 months before the next big development explodes in Amber's vanishing. In August of 2012, police obtain a 17-minute phone call recording from the Edmonton Romand Center featuring Amber Tukaro's voice. Amber appears to be in a car with an unidentified male. Authorities confirm the legitimacy of the audio clip and theorize the mysterious man in question is almost certainly involved with Amber's vanishing. By the end of the month, on Tuesday, August 28th, Project Care and the RCMP released the phone recording to news outlets who broadcast a one-minute excerpt to a national audience, asking citizens around the country if they can recognize or identify the unknown male's voice. Hundreds of tips pour in from concerned listeners. In a major coincidental twist, on Saturday, September 1st, 2012, a mere four days after the clip is released, a group of horseback riders stumble upon a fragment of human skull in a wooded area on rural farmland near Leduc in Leduc County, south of Edmonton. The bones are quickly sent for processing and dental records confirm they match Amber Tukaro's DNA profile. Her case transitions from a missing persons to an unsolved homicide. In the following weeks, months, and years, investigators continue their pleas for the general public to come forward with information about the male voice in Amber's final phone call, now understanding him to likely be her killer. Plenty of followers report potential persons of interest, but none are ever announced to the public or arrested. The most curious circumstance of all is a time when three separate women who wish to remain anonymous come forward to the police and say for certain they know who the voice belongs to. However, this man is apparently heavily searched and interrogated by investigators and cleared of having any connection to Amber. Sadly, from 2012 to the present day, Amber's unsolved death has only grown colder. The male voice has yet to be identified, and the longer it freezes, the more forgotten it becomes by society. The most recent update came on January 24th, 2020, when a young man from Edmonton called the RCMP and stated he believed his father was not only the male driver in Amber's case, but also responsible for the deaths of other murdered women in the Leduc County area. The RCMP investigated the claim, but found it to be unsubstantiated. They said the claimant had a history of reporting fabricated tips, and that some of the murdered women's cases he said his father had involvement with were already solved. As of today, both the RCMP and Project Care investigators are still asking for people to call in with any leads to identifying the unknown man or solving Amber's homicide case in general. Of all the odd peculiarities prodding out of Amber's case file, none cuts deeper than the mysterious phone call recording obtained by police and major news outlets two years after Amber Tukaro's initial disappearance. While the exact time of the phone call has never been specified, it's collectively agreed upon to be the last communication Amber made with any of her family or friends, and the final clue she left behind before she was ultimately killed. Thus, it's believed the phone call recording took place originally on August 18th, 2010, the day Amber vanished and passed away. It happened in the later evening hours when Amber decided to leave her son with her friend and travel into Edmonton that night rather than the following day. To save money for lodging, Amber decided to forego a taxi or paid car service and hitchhiked with a stranger. During the ride with the unidentified man, Amber entered a telephoned conversation with her brother, who made a phone call from prison at Edmonton's Remand Center, where all outgoing communication is recorded and preserved. 
The entire talk is 17 minutes long, but only about one minute was released by authorities, claiming it's the only vital piece of information relevant to Amber's death. Before I play this recording, I want to warn listeners that the audio clip could be distressing for some. For those who want to hear, please pay close attention to the voice of the male subject. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Are you fucking kidding me? You better not take... You better not take me anywhere I don't want to go. I want to go into the city. Okay. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? No, we're not. Then where the f*** are these roads going to? 50th Street. 50th Street, are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? 50th Street. 50th Street? 50th Street. Jeez, right? You can't go over the town. Problem. The ending of the clip is not the ending of this conversation. However, in an interview with Tutsi Tukaro, CBC News reported that Tutsi had heard the entire recording and said it ended abruptly, detecting fear in Amber's voice. But as I'm sure you noticed, even within the one minute we have available, there is a level of discomfort emanating from Amber's question. While she holds firm on her desires and remains vocal, there is a sense of unease. The unknown man is clearly lying with Amber, at first saying they're heading south or north of Beaumont. Later in the recording, he says he's taking her to 50th Street. However, locals of Edmonton claim there are no gravel roads on 50th Street and that he was most likely driving down countryside roads in the complete opposite direction. The suspect also sounds as if he laughs at one point in the clip, hinting at a potentially deranged motive. Regardless, it's obviously painful to hear Amber's final words confessing her concern with the man taking her someplace she doesn't want to go. It's highly probable that the man in this recording is the man who took Amber's life, or at least he was one of the final people to make contact with her and absolutely knows of her fate. Hundreds of people have called in to the RCMP over the years with tips and names of possible suitors, yet investigators have never confirmed or released a name, rather explaining that they've researched all leads and have yet to find someone who fits the man's profile. Without a doubt, someone out there has also heard this male subject's voice before and could come forward with absolutely vital information. If you or anyone you know might be able to identify the voice heard in Amber Tukaro's final phone call, please alert the proper authorities. Although audio from telephones and secondary recordings can distort a person's voice, identifying the man behind this audio clip will likely be the information needed to finally crack Amber's case. Bringing a family in mourning much deserved closure and bringing justice to light against a killer. In the years since Amber Tukaro's murder, plenty of theories have been constructed by her family, by Edmonton residents, and concerned followers of the case all across Canada. Most often they revolve around the tragic audio recording of Amber's haunting final phone call and pinpointing the identity of the man behind the wheel, driving her towards doom. One popular theory attempting to identify Amber's killer derives from three women who called in with testimonies about who the male voice belongs to in Amber's phone recording, soon after it was released in 2012. The first woman who alerted authorities claimed she was certain she knew who the voice was, saying she was able to perfectly picture him in the scene of Amber's final moments. 
The name of this male individual was not released to the public, but soon after, two new women followed up the report with additional claims that they believed the voice to be of the same male individual. Three random incidents of three separate women all reporting the same person rings highly suspicious. The RCMP thought so too, but has since announced that the male individual has no connection to Amber or her final days in Edmonton. And yet, those unidentified women believe the claims against the man were not investigated thoroughly. After some digging by curious third parties across the internet, it was discovered that the person in question, reported by the three women, was a man by the name of Pat Carson. Pat Carson is an infamous figure of the Edmonton, Canada area, known for his criminal record and arrests for sexual assault, procuring juvenile prostitutes, and physically assaulting a woman by choking her to overcome her resistance. He was released from prison on January 28th, 2003, and returned home to his horse ranch in Sandy Beach, Alberta. Ever since, he has been residing there, working around his land and fixing machinery, while also posting advertisements across Craigslist and other internet forums for people to come and work on his ranch as apprentices. This is where things become murky and disturbing. Since being released from prison, countless stories of Pat and his horse ranch have populated blogs and Reddit threads online, discussing his severely suspicious activity and history of disturbing behavior. In fact, there is an entire website dedicated solely to warning young people and anyone who comes into contact with his job postings, allowing people to share their stories of horror in regards to both Pat himself and the ranch. Multiple people talk about how manipulative he was over the phone and in person, talking about taking naked photos for wood carvings to generate revenue. One detailed story from a woman who visited the ranch in the mid 2000s repeated similar circumstances and how Pat would use alter egos and ask for full body massages. The same victim went on saying how she realized she wasn't safe at his ranch and telling of how she once went through his things one night when he wasn't home and found he had saved pornographic photos of young Japanese women he had convinced to come and work on his ranch years prior, along with shrines of the women and videos of them flexing their muscles. Another woman who ended up on the ranch found the exact same materials and claimed Pat would talk at length about how fond he was of Asian women. The most harrowing stories were of a woman who survived time alone at Pat's horse ranch, but said that when they expressed their desire to leave, he would argue against it, and sometimes offer to take the woman on, quote, one final horse ride in the dead of night, in the dead of winter. These women claim that had they given in to Pat's requests, they would no longer be alive. One of Pat's full-time stable hands, a man under the moniker of Richard, was also reported to engage inappropriately with female visitors, acting like a ringleader in getting young women to be alone with his boss. We visited Pat's Facebook page for his ranch, and on a photo of this supposed Richard, a commenter wrote, quote, So you're the guy who thinks Pat is a nice, normal guy, eh? You must be just as sick. I've informed the police about this site and the blog and the fact that the name changes. You must be the boy who goes to Edmonton and picks the girl out with him and talks them into going there. What part of that do you think is okay? The most curious story in relation to Amber, however, came five years ago in a woman's testimonial about how she and her friend went to work on Pat's ranch when she was 19 in order to earn a little extra cash. This is an excerpt from her story. Quote, he often brought up people who had stayed with him before, and all of them had left suddenly and maybe unexpectedly. As the days went on, his welcoming nature began to give way to a very temperamental and aggressive one. I didn't really find him creepy, but intolerable. I didn't like him at all. He seemed extremely socially inept and said inappropriate things. It was also extremely apparent that he did not view women as equal or anywhere near equal to men. One day, he told us to get in the truck because we were going to the city. We were way out in the country, so it was a long ride, but he was really excited about going. He asked us to walk around and ask young people to come and work with us on the ranch. This made us super uncomfortable. We were introverts and just felt very odd to approach people and ask them to get in the truck. He got upset by our disapproval. 
So we got out and pretended to look for people to talk to. He also went to talk to people on his own. The reason this sticks out so much in relation to Amber's death is the confirmation that both Pat and his suspicious stable hand are both known for driving around town looking for young women, offering money and monetary help in exchange for their services. Notice that Pat also referenced traveling into the city, a verbiage mirroring what the mysterious man in Amber's phone call told her before her death. Throw in the criminal record and the predatory behavior and bizarre actions towards women of different ethnicities, and it's safe to say Pat Carson fits the profile of a disturbed and dangerous individual. This being said, the RCMP did clear him of any wrongdoing in Amber's case. Not only this, but some women who visited the ranch and shared their stories of terror remarked on Amber's case that the voice in her phone recording didn't sound like Pat, at least in their opinion. There are arguments on both sides, but theorists refuse to drop Pat as a suspect until a more in-depth investigation is carried out. Some also theorize that Richard, the stable hand, could be the voice on the Tukaro phone call perhaps picking up Amber in one of his runs through the city to convince people to come to the ranch. Another prominent theory, one raised by Tutsi Tukuro herself, is that Amber was the victim of a serial killer still at large in the Leduc County area in Canada. This theory stems from multiple missing person reports of women posted throughout the county between 2000 and 2010. Four of these cases ended up as unsolved homicides when remains of four different young girls were discovered on multiple rural properties near Leduc. The first three victims were all last seen in Edmonton in April of 2003 and May of 2004. The first body was found in July of 2004, but two others weren't found until April of 2015. All four ladies were found in an eight kilometer radius, suggesting that their killer could be the same person. There isn't much more evidence than only a pattern of gender and burial locations, but it does make one wonder if there's a more sinister scheme happening in Leduc County. In addition, you may remember us covering the Highway of Tears in a previous video earlier in 2020, about the 750 kilometer stretch of road from Prince George to Prince Rupert, Canada, in which countless women and children have gone missing or been murdered without any explanation. Many of the women part of the Highway of Tears are indigenous and fit similar profiles of Amber Tukuro. While Amber's murder is another 750 kilometers away from the highway's original mapping, it does make one wonder if there was a murderer targeting that specific stretch of road. Could they have expanded their territory in the hopes to throw investigators off their scent? Or did they worry about leaving behind too many clues in the same area and move westward to try and randomize their spree of terror? These are all legitimate questions with a complete lack of answers. Without a doubt, however, there could be a connection in both sets of circumstances, a connection in the mistreatment and inherent racism against indigenous peoples across all of Canada. There is certainly a sad trend in the Highway of Tears cases, and Amber's own profile is just a microcosm of a bigger issue. While there may not be one specific or physical killer sabotaging all these women and children, it could be a similar modus operandi and mindset that these women are dying at the hands of prejudice and nationalistic evil. Groups that tout these awful ways of thinking and living could be the targets of investigation, and it's completely plausible that Amber was a victim of a hate crime or somebody who simply wanted to take advantage of an indigenous female. The final theory of prominence highlights the lack of effort given by the RCMP and fellow investigators during the height of Amber's case, specifically in the beginning. Remember that when Tootsie first called in her daughter missing, the police literally told her it wasn't going to be an issue, that Amber would return her calls after a night of partying. They had absolutely zero pretense to make such a clumsy assumption, and it could have been the decision that cost Amber her life. Not only this, but the Tukuro family claimed frequent mishaps by the police during their daughter's trial, citing a lack of efforts and inconclusive briefings. Even the people calling in leads to the authorities, such as the three unidentified women who dropped Pat Carson's name, felt the inspectors weren't doing enough to justify their findings. Thus, theorists speculate Amber's disappearance and homicide might have been somehow related to law enforcement, perhaps committed by someone under the protection of the police. 
Perhaps, as some argue, this all connects back to the overall racism issue Indigenous people face in Canada. Living on reservations and dealing with jurisdiction issues across the country, cases involving tribal members are often swept under the rug and forgotten about, or simply never even attempted to be solved at all. Even if Amber's murder isn't that of law enforcement corruption, it could definitely be the results of higher-ups choosing to ignore her due to her background as an indigenous individual. It is a heartbreaking thought, but also a story that we are all too familiar with in many cases in Canada and around North America. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Amber Tukaro's unsolved death, we want to make known that our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In the case of Amber, we believe she was ultimately taken advantage of by a predatory man seeking to harm innocent young women. Whether it was a one-off circumstance or the act of a serial killer cannot be said for certain, but without a doubt, some sick individual was out preying on unsuspecting subjects, and sadly, Amber fell victim that evening. Maybe she was attempting to go into the city or simply just trying to make some extra cash for the next day's adventure. Regardless, she didn't hitchhike without a reason and wouldn't go down without a fight, which is probably why she ended up where she did. It's important to remember that her remnants were discovered on a patch of land about 17 minutes away from her last known activity at the motel, almost the exact same length of her phone call with her brother. Tutsi Tukuro, who had listened to the entire recording, has stated her daughter sounded happy and normal at the beginning of the conversation, but by the end, she was on to her driver's dishonesty and potential danger. She says the call ended abruptly, leading us to believe that the 17-minute call ended right before her murder, where she was either buried immediately or brought back to the scene later into the night by her killer. Just who the perpetrator was cannot be said for certain. What we do know is he is a master manipulator and familiar with the Edmonton area. During the phone call, one can hear him feeding false directions to Amber, saying they were headed in the direction of town when really they were on another road headed south, on country pathways made of gravel, and nowhere near the city like she'd asked. The landmarks he mentions are all correct, but jumbled in a way to convince Amber he is doing what she wants long enough before the confusion sets in. The man knew what he was up to all along, and, as things stand now, his evil doing still exists somewhere out in the world, potentially harming others, like he harmed Amber and the entire Tukuro family. Most disheartening of all is that Amber's case is just one in an infinite pool of unsolved missing and murdered indigenous women in both Canada and all across North America. It is an absolute catastrophe how these real human beings and their families are forgotten, cast away without a second thought or a drop of empathy. They had dreams and aspirations and goals that could have changed the world for the better. So why are they ripped from society and forgotten in the blink of an eye? It's a real-world tragedy that must be stopped immediately, with awareness spread to hopefully stop the never-ending chaos. With jurisdiction disputes and lack of funding and resources given to indigenous people on their reservations, they begin the race a step behind. But just by sharing these stories, by alerting governments and authorities of any information you may have to solve cold cases, and by telling others of the injustices these women and children face, we can maybe maybe help deliver the compassion, hope, and justice the native tribes across North America not only need, but deserve. In terms of Ampatukuro, we will not remember her as another number in a database or a folder in a filing cabinet, but as a strong and courageous fighter, a devoted friend and caring family member, a loving daughter, sister, mother, and aunt. We will remember her dedication to serving those in need, her passion for music and pure desire to make others happy. Amber Tukuro's life may have been stolen from her in a mindless murder on August 18th, 2010, but her memory, her voice, and her spirit lives on. 
If you have any information regarding the unidentified man's voice or the final days Amber was last seen alive, please contact Crime Stoppers at 1 800 222 8477. This is Cold Case Detective. And there you have the facts. I'd like to give a very special shout out to our Chief Detective Patrons, Tilly Milner, Carrie Reitman, Carolyn Simmons Croft, Katerina Faustoff, Daniel Halfstone, Jennifer Babcock, Nick M, Miranda Mack, and Anthony Lesh, along with all of our Patreon supporters for making this series possible. If you'd like to support us for as little as $2 a month, you can do so by checking out our Patreon by following the link below. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.